So I wanted to ask today, are we witnessing something strange? Uh, or is it just manifestations of a collection of the same basic things? And I need to find the... Okay, so... So uh, first, I wanted to uh, give a quote uh, from Edward Leed Scalin from 1949. What is a magnet? The real magnet is the substance that is circulating in the metal. Each particle in the substance is an individual magnet by itself, and the both north and south pole individual magnets. They are so small that they can pass through anything. In fact, they can pass through the metal easier than through air. They are in constant motion. They are running one kind of magnets against the other, and if guided in the right channels, they possess perpetual power. The North and South Pole magnets are the cosmic force. They hold together this Earth and everything in it. Each North and South Pole magnet is equal in strength, but the strength of each individual magnet doesn't amount to anything. To be of practical use, they will have to be in great numbers. In permanent magnets, they are circulating in the metal in great numbers. Okay, so uh, there's going to be a little bit of a magnetic theme to what I'm going to present. And this is largely because I feel that uh, the, witness, the, the phenomenon that we are witnessing uh, has a, a, a sensible magnetic component to it. And I really hope I can get this to focus, but I don't know why I can't. But anyway, uh, come on. Okay. So um, Ken Shoulders said in 2010 uh, in an interview that was done between John Hutchison, John Hutchison's wife, Nancy Lazarian, and himself, uh, uh, Ken Shoulders is responding to a question from Nancy and he says, oh yeah, absolutely. I start out with baby ones. That's just a technique I happen to have. That's old, but I start out with tiny, tiny ones and I watch them grow and I can grow them and grow them. And Nancy asks, do they get fed? Do they get feed? What do you feed them? And Ken Shoulders says, more electrons. They need electrons. They become electrons. And so Ken was able to hold the exotic vacuum objects that he made uh, in a penning trap. Uh, and you probably know better than I what that is, but it's a... a, a a combination between a quadrupole uh, electric field and a, a B field. And so he held them in there and he was able to feed them electrons and study their properties. Again, on uh, Ken Shoulders, he said, now electrical engineering does not let charge disappear, but it does in this multiple toroidal form. You see, in a, an EVO is a cluster. It's one way of thinking of it, of electrons. And you know, and physics says, yeah, well, you can get Cooper pairs at two muons, 207 times the electron, and maybe tauons, 3,477 3, times the electron. Beyond that, they are all just clusters of electrons of a larger size. But heck, they rarely go above 100, and I see them into the billions worth. No trouble at all. So I am working with a way upscale class of guys. It enshrouds stuff. This is all written in some of the things on the web. When it enshrouds things, it can actually, it can allow them to disappear. It, it does make atoms disappear in my laboratory work. Well, that's very interesting, you know, because when they disappear, I can transport all this stuff through to somewhere else and it reappears. That's teleportation. So it does that very nicely. It's written in the law that, it, uh, that says this, and he says this in a parrot tone. He goes, charge is conserved, mass is conserved, energy is conserved, E equals MC squared, and all hitched together. Wrong, just dead wrong. Because I can take one of these funny little particles and change its charge from actual measurement. This is no hand-waving thing. I can measure it with an instrument. I can do it any day you want to. You can change it over a billion to one and still have it visible. 
The heck of it is, I can still keep reducing the charge to where it becomes an item that walks right through things. Finally, one day, it showed up. I was shooting through metal. It shouldn't be able to transmit that particle charged through a piece of metal. It did it. No problem. Violation of physics. Fundamental, nasty violation. Okay, so I'm just going to throw this slide in here because it's a bit of speculation and for discussion that you might want to discuss later. But, um, and you're probably far more well equipped to understand what I might be getting at here. But the question is, can neutrinos be magnetic? And there's an article there that you can go and look at and it dis discusses how magnetic various neutrinos can be depending on their type, density, and mass. Um, or potentially, are we looking at some phenomena related to pions from the stellation of ultra-dense hydrogen, according to Holmley? And pions can be focused by magnetic fields because um, uh, myself and uh, other authors uh, have been able to sort of guide these things using magnets. Um, and so I've, I've given a link there to magnetic horn. Um, and then one, one thing that they say is if it has mass, then potentially it has a, a, a better magnetic moment. And it says uh, cold neutrinos have mass. Uh, and if string vortex solitons, that's a nod to you, Alexander Shishkin, um, are condensed toroids of cold neutrinos, then they have density also. So I just wanted to put that in there before I go on to some of the experimental examples. Now, in Sochi, I shared uh, a, some details about a reactor, a fuel processor by an Indian called Suhas Ralkar. And here you see the uh, dimensions of some of the sonic horns that were used. Now there was 4.5 uh, kilowatts of ultrasound put into a small chamber. And that was it with three lots of one and a half kilowatts, 19.46 kilohertz sound. And the chamber looked like this. And you've got three views. You can see on the bottom right, you have the piezoelectric uh, uh, units. And it, there are three horns, cross axis. And in the core of that, you have a cooling manifold around the central fuel processor element, which is that water area you see in the bottom left. Well, when I visited Suhas Raukar, he provided me with uh, some, uh, I'm going to try and get your translation here in focus. I don't know what, just go straight out of focus. What can I do? Let me just try and maybe my controller will help. Uh, can help? Oh God, no. Okay. No. Sorry. Um, uh, he provided me with some fuel and I had this idea to use a piece of software combined with a standard webcam uh, to do uh, uh, capture of uh, these exotic vacuum object structures. And so I set it up for 145 hours using a Logitech C910 camera. And this was masked. As you can see, I used some PTFE tape and some masking tape. And at the beginning of the sample period, I had, uh, I, I had it covered over with some metal. But at the beginning of the sample period, it started with the, the CCD flat to the sample. And by the end of 170 hours, the masking tape had sort of come away a little bit and it come into an inclined position, as you see there on the right. The software I used uh, was written by a Russian-speaking individual. We helped uh, uh, pay for a little modification to the software. And you can see it here. It's free. You can get it at foxylab.com. And it, you can select the webcam that you are detecting with. And uh, you can set the threshold, i.e. the RG or B threshold, that it must exceed before it makes a event. It actually records the event times uh, in the name and uh, in the software. And so you know precisely when it occurred. So in terms of logging strange uh, radiation events, there's, there's one problem with x-rays, which has been identified by the community. And that is if you have two x-rays and, and they are, let me try this so you can see. Yeah. Um, if you have two x-rays, 
and uh, they are, um, I don't know why that's not working, sorry. Um, if you have two x-rays uh, and they are rubbing together and you have a little uh, crystal of say sand in there or, or, or some dust and they rub around, you get a three body interaction. And this can produce tracks similar to what are being witnessed with strange radiation. And so this may produce some false positive tracks that can't obviously happen with a uh, element in a web camera because it's and, and also you know that it's traveling through several different mediums uh, out of the container through the air through the masking of the webcam and uh, through the glass and infrared sensor on the front of the uh, picture element and into the ccd so uh, this is one of the tracks that I found during that period from that echo fuel. So this is ultrasonically uh, stimulated fuel. It was uh, stimulated for in excess of 160 hours. So it's a long process of producing this thing, but it, it seems to be very active. But the technique that I'm giving you here is very, very affordable. The webcam is about $70. The software is free. And you do need a computer per monitor, but if you had multiple laptops, you could monitor, uh, monitor a sample from many angles. It can pinpoint the event, because it's 120 samples per minute in my case, it can pinpoint an event down to half a second uh, over you know, weeks. And it can capture many simultaneous events if present. So if you had a source that was producing a vast number of uh, strange radiation or exotic vacuum objects, or string vortex solitons, there's a potential to capture many at the same time on the CCD. And because you know the size of the CCD, you can predict exactly or work out exactly the scale of the, um, the strange radiation track. And also you don't need any microscopy because you automatically get the image and the image is relative to the scale of the impinging radiation. Um, and so it also gives you some indication of depth. That is to say that depending, <laughs> depending on the depth into the sensor, you get a, a sense of brightness or, or darkness. So, um, uh, and there's no question, uh, in, as I said earlier, that this is a three body interaction problem, okay? So uh, this is uh, one of the big takeaways, I hope, that you can get out of this presentation, that there is a very, very affordable way for you to um, do uh, strange radiation monitoring that seems to have worked for me. Okay, so now I want to talk about various samples that I've tested, um, which exhibit some of the features that have been talked about with this radiation over the years. And the first is a sample uh, from John Hutchison that was made in 2007. And this was uh, in a, an environment of a, a bias of about half a million volts from a Van de Graaff generator at about uh, five meters away from the sample. The sample was on a plastic crate to prevent uh, loss of any electrical uh, charge buildup. And there was various radio frequencies used. Now, on this sample, there are various structures at various scales. The first scale, uh, which is very predominant, are uh, in or out structures, or <laughs> what Matsumoto called in the 1990s, uh, white holes. So the white hole kind of, kind of structure is on the right, and the sort of uh, kind of direct um, perpendicular impacts uh, with the magnetic lines in or out of, of, of the paper is on, uh, of the aluminium is on the left. And these are a radius of 100 microns. There are smaller structures, but I've started the scaling at 100 microns. Uh, the next scale up is uh, uh, 400 microns. And you can see I put the radius there of the substructure at 100 microns. So we have the 100 microns then coming into the structure that is uh, 400 microns. And then uh, the next scale up uh, uh, has a lot more detail on it on this slide. So you can see I've, I've put a radii of the 200 micron structure in the, the top center of this slide. 
And then in the uh, middle to right, I have uh, some notations where there is a 20 micron inner area. And as, as it goes down the sweep of the affected aluminium, it grows to 28.9 microns. So what I'm saying is that the, uh, this tier of structure, this 400 micron structure is sitting on its side perpendicular and it is pinched on the inside. And if we look at a sort of top strike mark here, this is, this is the same one. Uh, note, note that the radii of the top center structure here is extending out to the left. So the actual size of the structure is larger than the impression on the aluminium. But the actual structure is uh, around about a 16 <coughs> micron uh, exotic vacuum object. And the substructure is the 400 micron uh, sub substructure. And so this is the overall view that you have. And actually, I think uh, one I, on the next slide, on the next slide, I want to refer back to, because I thought, has anyone seen something similar to this in the literature? Because we know that Shoulders concluding his research is saying that these are multiple toroidal clusters, um, but he'd never actually described what they look like. But this sample, and, but he did say that these were all over Hutchison samples. Well, I went into the literature and I looked at the paper of Nardi and Bostic and I have given a link there, and you may well have seen this particular slide. And in the text on figure two at the bottom, it specifically says that note the hole formed by pinched electrons at the center of a large D4D ring. And if you hadn't guessed it, every single structure and substructure on the Hutchison sample was this ratio D4D. Uh, I have a, a little animation here of this bottom one here. Which you, you can see the lighting going round of that structure. Now, whilst there is a direct uh, um, perpendicular uh, uh, toroid shape, there is also a sweeping shape. So it's, it's like um, something is being shifted around between the toroids. Anyway, my, my conclusion to the structure at this level <clears throat> is this. And so uh, none of these actual toroids move. They're all locked in place magnetically. Um, but uh, they, they uh, effectively are kind of moving things in them. And because they move things in them, they then effectively move things around the structure. So if you can imagine the smallest ring is not the smallest division of this structure, but it's a representation of a fractal version of the bigger item. So the very smallest ring is, is rotating material around itself in the normal form that you would expect, uh, uh, toroidal and poloidal movement. But this then moves things around the biggest structure, and the biggest structure around the super. And so it, it scales uh, like this. And, and I'm saying that this is just a simplified three-level building block. But you can imagine that the magnetic fields just in this three-level building block are, you've got all of the vectors in there. Okay, so now I want to talk about a different uh, uh, experiment. I will skip some of the slides because I already presented some of the. Uh, okay, so this is the Lion reactor. This is a deuterated diamond, industrial diamond in nickel, and that's in the core. And then it has uh, alumina outside. And then it has two coils of uh, copper wire wound around the outside. And then that sits into a uh, um, quartz uh, tube furnace here. Now, on one of the experiments, uh, there was a, a structure which was, I think, around about 12 millimeters across. It's very large. It was outside of the reactor. And here we are. We're seeing something that's come from potentially inside of the reactor. It's come out. And it has been captured by the bend in the heater coil. And you can see on the center left, there is a spot in the bend in that wire. And under the SEM, that <coughs> vortex structure of de deposits of, of a, a staged uh, um, quantization of different elements. And uh, it, it's only on the top surface. It's no, no damage whatsoever on the bottom. So it looks like the field is going round and round. Uh, 
uh, from the right side toroid to the left side uh, uh, structure. So is it one large magnetic loop? And you're seeing the vortex around the magnetic loop. And you can see also around the very white area, there is a, a larger area that is uh, damaged. I want to go to another structure on a different experiment, but the, of the same family. This is in a different experiment. But the, the, in, in this case, this structure was in line with the B field. OK, and it was on the top. Gravi gravitationally, it was on the top. Uh, but the, the damage, um, I think, in this case, is on the outside. OK, so it actually went all the way through, and then it started damaging from the outside in. This structure is on about halfway up the fused quartz. And if you can see, in the left, left bottom segment, there are two sections. And in the right section of that structure, the, the item has fractured into three bits. And this would imply three superstructures that are highly magnetic, forming part of this, the substructure of this lava, lar larger overall structure. And this has worked its way from the inside out. Now, I expect that the silicon uh, and oxygen has been largely transmuted into carbon. Uh, that is why the, there is discoloration there. And you can see it's burrowed its way in a fractal sort of dichotron instability way uh, in, into the glass. But in fact, the glass is perfectly smooth on the outside. So it's burrowed about 70% through the thickness of the glass before the reaction or the experiment was stopped. You may also notice the type of hexagonal arrays on, on the uh, left hand part of the left inside section. So this, again, is in line, perfectly in line with the B field, but it's in a different orthogonal orientation. So it definitely looks like it could be something that is a superstructure that's based on something like this, where they build in this orthogonal magnetic kind of fashion. Now, further, magnetic aftermath. I have two examples here. The one on the left is spheres that have teleported from material that's been taken from inside of the reactor and it's gone through the fused quartz and then it's been disrupted at the surface of the fused quartz and it's depos depos deposited three spheres that are held holding on to each other magnetically. On the right, you have a piece of aluminium from John Hutchison. And in my mind, what has happened is exotic vacuum objects have uh, started to grow on the grain boundaries in the aluminium. They've then coalesced and they've grabbed the whole section of the aluminium and taken ownership of it. And then they kind of shifted around and moved around. Now, small exotic vacuum objects on the surface have caused a near liquid state. It's not liquid, but it's, it's, it's mobile. And when the uh, influencing fields are switched off, the magnetic array is left there uh, as a kind of splintered aluminium that's all mashed back together. Now, the, these are physical embodiments of what I believe is a highly magnetic clustering structure. In the, the dental x-rays here that we used for Lion, uh, he put the um, reactor that I showed you here into this uh, T-tin, which had these self-developing x-rays. Uh, they are very affordable, three centimeters by four centimeters. This was... Uh, exposed and it came an, uh, out with these uh, what I call two spots. Uh, these fields, uh, uh, I believe there was something like was coming out of like a, a spin vortex, magnetic flux, like um, it comes out of the sun. Okay. And uh, I saw these things in the pool uh, on a swimming pool where you have a half soliton in the water and it produces a shadow from the sun. So on the left, leftmost, you have two from the X-ray and in the center, you have the reflections, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, lens light from the sun on the bottom of a swimming pool. And then this was the center part of this frame is my hypothesis for what was going on uh, along the lines of what was going on in the sun. 
And so I went back to the scanning electron microscope, placed the reactor under the scanning electron microscope, and at the point identified by this red circle here, I found a series of structures that were mirrored, had a center line, didn't interact with each other, um, but were on the surface in exactly the way that I predicted it might be based on this chart. Moreover, I found other structures which had magnetic sensibilities to them and were showing the transport of material through a flux loop. And so you can see this large one here, I call it the cannon in, in the, the sort of center of the right hand SEM. And it, it, it's projected material out and when it's over a valley and when the music stopped, what happened was the, this material, this line and this swirl ejected out and it fell onto the, the broad copper oxide. And actually that material is not the same as the bulk of the copper oxide. And it is, uh, if you see, uh, it is 19. So if you look at 19, it has zirconium in there where there's no zirconium in the, the reactor uh, uh, elements. And so it's only in that line. And I talked a bit about this during um, uh, my Scotchy presentation. Now, furthermore, on the Lion experiments, here we have, on the left, we have an X-ray from Lion 3, and we have some damage to the inside fused quartz of Lion 1. And these are very, very curious structures. I call them the ears. They even have the little dangly bit that some people have on, on the ears. But it seems to be a structure that, that these uh, things like to form. And I just want to compare that to the uh, Euro European Space Agency composite of a uh, um, sunspot. And you can see the magnetic flux lines uh, 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 during a proton flare between uh, two sunspots. And is, if I overlay that onto the X-ray and the damage to the inside of the quartz, it is an absolute dead ringer match. Now, <laughs> don't ask me, but that is exactly where it's going. It even has this curious little ear bit down here, the bit that hangs down. It is, if I, if I pause that, uh, if I pause it on the start frame. No, not for that frame. It's this ear bit that hangs down here. You've got an ear bit that hangs down here. On the magnetic, a magnetic structure, structure from the solar uh, observatory image, you see the thing that comes down here. So uh, I, I believe that the level of magnetic self-organization of exotic vacuum objects is completely unlimited by scale. Most of unlimited. Sorry, someone's microphone's on. Um, it, it's limited by... Uh, um, uh, basically environment and the food that it can be given. I want to talk about another experiment. This is one that was, this is one that was designed um, in uh, Hungary by Dr. George Eagley and funded by a group in Switzerland. It's called the Supernova. And on this experiment, I found structures which also looked like they are self-organized. And actually the one on the right, which has this hexagonal kind of diacotron instability type feature on the outside looks exactly like that published from the one point cold fusion studies by Matsumoto in 1993. So without a doubt, these structures are self organizing. And so I give all of the links so you can go and have a look at these when you get the PDF presentation. I will quickly run through a whole series of slides here before I get on to uh, some other points that I want to make before closing out. So these are structures that I have observed in the inside cavity of the, uh, uh, the uh, supernova reactor. And this one is very similar to a kind of this plasmac, which is one idea of how uh, these kind of structures could form. And this is from an expired 1977 patent by Paul Collock. And so it's described here, it's too small for you to read. You can look at it in your own time. You can go and see the paper. But you can see that a, a highly magnetic flux lines with your toroidal and your poloidal features has this kind of layered toroidal and poloidal structure. And it, the, the magnetic uh, um, structure intensity uh, 
pulls and pushes such that there is a skin around the outside. And I remember uh, um, Klimov referring to some structures that he found in his reactors as being spherical. And it may well be that the spherical structures that he, the hollow spherical structures that he found in his uh, ash is a, is a result of something like this. Now, if you imagine you take this sphere and you kind of squish and squash it, you could end up with something like this. So what I'm saying is that the magnetic pressure is squished. And what you'll notice is that the inside of this structure is, is smaller than the outside, which is exactly what we observe on the change of uh, dimension from the inside of this large exotic vacuum object strike mark and the outside. You can see it's growing as it goes out. Okay. So, uh, so extending this on, I have a whole series of images here, which I'll quickly go through. And these are strike marks, and, and I haven't identified what the material is. It may well be silicon. The inside of the reactor is just aluminium. And under polarizing light, you can see this field region here. So I have there a hexagon. This is a pentagon. And you can see these kind of mesh-like structures in the center. This is a truncated uh, hexagon. And you can see it has this circular section in the middle with these very definite structure in the middle. Then this substructure around the outside and then the overall field influence, which is this uh, truncated structure. Now I want to go to Japan now. And this is uh, from experiments that I did last year with Roy Shinomaza. And this is cavitation. Uh, he didn't think it was cavitation, but I proved it was cavitation. Uh, both he had the ultrasonic level, even though it was only operating in the hundreds of Hertz. The, the veins, it was producing cavitation. And uh, what I've done and on the top here is compared the uh, uh, bubble-like structures with the field influence areas that I observed on the uh, vibration plates with the uh, Matsumoto structure uh, that he uh, presented in uh, ship for fusion technology in 1993. And whilst he only shared this one, he, he talked about them being quite common. And I just want you to imagine this structure rolling around on a uh, piece of metal uh, producing a strange radiation track. But in this case, it's, it's rolling around as a virtual kind of like semi-neutral structure on my CCD here. And the angles are all the same. The, the structure is the same. And what are we looking at? We are looking at structures that are five and six a piece. They're five and six a piece, like the uh, six we see here and the five we see here. And then I, that brings me to Bogdanovich. So we're back in Russia here now, you know this work. And it's recent work. And he's saying here, a stream of particles, presumably electrons, which causes air to blow, a similar pattern is observed after the emission of electrons from electron source or their injector through the oil, is emitted from the surface. After 10 to 20 seconds, this stream is formed into a set of several rings, five or six of the same diameter which rotate around both their own common axis parallel to the plane horizontal. If you can imagine this structure rotating around, would you see something like this if it impacted a surface? If this was rolling across the surface, influencing the surface, would we see a track that looks like many of the tracks we see that are more complicated than the ones that could be explained by straight rings that are oscillating? And here is another one uh, just before I move on. Okay, so I'm, I'm nearly uh, coming to the test that I want to recommend. And uh, what is the evidence for the test? Well, these are several different data points that I want to talk about here. One is the Thermocore. One is Rossi's original presentation. One is something that we did. One that Zatalepin and Baranov talked about <coughs> when I was in Sochi. And one that was published yesterday by Desireless uh, when he was doing a replication uh, analog of Mizuno's R20 reactor. In the Thermocore event, they put 2.5 pounds of nickel powder, this was in 1996, 200 mesh, into a three liter stainless dewar. Basically, they heated it and evacuated it, and then they put uh, uh, hydrogen in, fresh hydrogen. It says the most amazing thing happened next. The powder immediately and spontaneously heated before external power could be added. The dewar glowed orange, 800 degrees C, and the engineers ran for cover. No external heat had been used and no radiation monitors were running. The nickel had sintered into a glob alloyed into the vessel and could not be removed. 
The then owner of Thermocore, Yale Eastman, was frightened that an explosion was imminent and that someone could be killed. He forbade any further work on Leonard. The incident was not published. Now, what I will say about this is the glow orange is very typical of when you use Brown's gas or a gas on certain materials. I don't believe that it's due to the particular temperature, 800 degrees C, but it's actually a uh, plasma glowing effect and it's misinterpreted here. Yes, the structure can fail like it is failing and repeatedly failing in the lights of uh, the sun cell, um, but it isn't actually hot it is quite likely that you will get nickel sintering, and it is quite likely that it will alloy into the vessel. I've got Hutchison samples where brass has been taken through steel and left the steel in position, but it's actually alloyed in a way to it. It's actually translated through and left the steel in position. So, um, and, and this speaks back to what uh, uh, was being said by um, shoulders, that it can translate uh, nucleons through things. And I think Shishkin and his colleagues would agree this is possible. So you, you see this with fusing of different metals to glass and to stone and whatever with uh, Brown's gas uh, uh, torches. And particularly, there is a rat tail file that John Hutchison uh, did an experiment with once, and that glowed bright orange, but it was basically cool to the touch. And this is an effect in my understanding of exotic vacuum objects that are growing on the surface and they are ionizing the air in the immediate vicinity of the metal. And so it is not actually uh, making the metal orange hot. So I think they really needn't to have worried. Yes, it looks like it melted internally. It may actually have been quite warm because there would have been nucleon exchange reactions and the like that would have created a lot of energy. But it wasn't at hot so such that a uh, 2.5 of nickel powder and a huge steel uh, stainless steel d was actually at the temperature of 800 degrees C. Now, in Rossi's first demonstration on the 14th of January 2011, Francesco Cellani was sitting down seven to eight meters away from the ECAT. He had two battery-operated gamma detectors with him. He calibrated them. There should only be around about 60 in the region where he was in counts based on the calibration. But suddenly, for about one second, both detectors topped out at 1,000 plus counts. In fact, he doesn't know what they were saying. It was just full, full scale, analog scale. And so he calculated that if he was standing by the reactor at the time, it would be sort of about quarter of a million counts per second based on the fall off laws. And so everyone panicked and said that we, they should run out of the room because Rossi had got a big radioactive source out. This is eight meters, seven to eight meters away and a closed door between them. But anyway, luckily the momentary signal collapsed and about two minutes later, Rossi came into the waiting room to invite people in uh, to see the ECAT saying the reaction has started. Now in 2013, we had some Chalani wire in a cell that developed a leak. And so we had to refill it periodically. And in September of that year, we realized, uh, uh, our volunteer Matthew Vallat realized that every time he was refilling it, the counts tripled and then fell back away shortly. Uh, and so something was going on that was causing this uh, GMC 300 to produce a signal that looked like there was gamma coming out. At the time, we didn't know what it was, but we got a lot of information uh, from people around the world. And we got a lot of interest from some interesting people. Um, but anyway, uh, cutting that short, um, it, it, what I, how I interpret this now is that exotic vacuum objects were synthesized in that moment of injecting the fresh hydrogen. And we saw uh, the sort of smashing products of those as they were clustering. There are others at Sochi in 2018, October, on October the 5th, I believe. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes. Could, you, could you focus on your translation, translator device okay, yes. to do better? Okay, okay, it's okay, okay. I, I will try and copy and paste the translation, but it won't be the best afterwards. <laughs> okay, so um, at Sochi on October the 5th, 2018, Zatalepin said that he and Baranoff had reported that when injecting fresh hydrogen into a degassed heated nickel powder cell in their lab in Moscow, they saw strange radiation, I call black evos, uh, filling their entire lab. And researcher Desireless, uh, that's his pseudonym, 
he, um, come on. Come on, give me a... I don't know why. Uh, Desireless reported yesterday uh, about his Mizuno analog replication that there was a big gamma burst at the moment when the deuterium was first introduced. But after a few seconds, it returned back to background. Whenever mesh is exposed to air with low loading ratio, you can obtain gamma ray burst again. I mean the mesh must be heated again and deuterium applied. English is not his native language, so uh, it's not the best uh, syntax. I'm very sorry about this. I, I'm going to find a better way to do this next time. That's <laughs> uh, uh, fine. Uh, Come on. What? 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 Yes. I, I promised you to uh, you leave, you leave now. It, it's it's time you to go. I'm gonna finish in six minutes. Uh, six minutes. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So um, uh, so here we have five different examples of nickel, both in the mesh form and in the powder form, uh, and in the wire form, producing a burst of signal on a gamma detector or uh, uh, some such device uh, when fresh hydrogen is placed into a heated nickel environment. So what I'm suggesting is this. My proposal is to have a degassed carbonyl nickel in a vacuum heated dewar above the nickel curie temperature, but below the temperature that nickel, that nickel type will start to sinter. So if you're not using a wire and you're not using a mesh and you are using, say, the type of nickel powder that uh, Alexander Parkamov has used, I would suggest you keep it below 400 degrees. So you have a very small window between 353.878 or whatever it is and, and 400 degrees. But you want to be above the nickel curie temperature. Then inject your hydrogen isotopes. You can play around with the mixtures on those. Then the gas must take the nickel below and then above the nickel curie temperature as quickly as possible. This was data that was given to us by P and Telly. Now, if you're, you've got your thinking caps on, you will know why I'm specifically saying that in the context of the rest of this presentation. This will allow thermally driven catalytic break and excitation of hydrogen and threshold driven making of exotic vacuum objects. Okay, now I just want to, I've got two more slides. How to explain the observations. I'm going to throw a few ideas out there that have been in my head. One, the wave function or the substructure of the electron can be split and joined. Note, a similar statement to this was made by Bostic in 1957 when discussing his plasmoid research. He says, Perhaps study of the forms assumed by this putty may help us understand configurations such as the stars and galaxies. It may also throw light at the other end of the scale on the construction of the fundamental particles such as the electron, the proton, mesons and neutrinos. They too may be made of a self-organizing putty, a putty composed of the electromagnetic field and its own gravitational forces, which working together create bodies we know as particles. I think it's worth reading the other two segments on that page, but you can do that in your own time. So how to explain the observations? The rest of this is that neutrino and electron clusters are scale quantized due to field interaction uh, constraints. By that, I mean whatever it is that's forming these things, let's say it's something that's along these lines of structures. When they come to get together, they can only reach a certain tension between themselves before they then break to the next quantization level. Okay. Then trapped light or photons becomes the skin or wrapper of the cold neutrino cluster, making a virtual lepton type. That's a really way out there idea. You might want to think on that. Magnetically forms these EVOs, the, the substructures, they magnetically form structures which extend to those similar to any of the allotropes of carbon. These can combine, including nesting and or branching structures to form complex 3D structures. Now, when you get big, you have to, as shoulders identified, you have to have local ions to help stabilize the EVOs. So there are proximal, that is, in the center of, 
or local ions help stable, stabilize large EVOs. Point care and Doikatron effects help self-organization. I will talk about those in future presentations. Above a certain point and spatial configuration, they become self-feeding where matter is available. A combination of making, including stabilization, and breaking these structures explains all observations. There we go. I'm one minute early. <laughs> OK, Bob, one, one minute earlier. OK, uh, uh, Bob, you yeah. can, you, I ask you to send me a, in any case, send me your presentation and I your will. translation, this, if it's possible, by, no. by, by email. And I will send you today, uh, uh, tonight, uh, the uh, video record of our, of your, of, of this, your report. And okay. now you can go to your son. I, I, can I just say a couple of things? I, I want to thank uh, uh, over there, Irina, thank you for, um, the concepts of the, the, the kind of like structures that may be forming strange radiation. Um, I think that if you consider what I've said in this presentation, that uh, it could be um, uh, these allotropes, that is things like buckyballs, this is graphene, this is uh, uh, um, uh, tubes, uh, you know, nanotubes, all of these are diamond structures. All of these structures are the kind of structures that I witness being created by these magnetic structures. So you have a virtual particle that is the EVO that can self-organize and it can be stimulated to self-organize by a range of things like electromagnetic field interactions, sound, light pressures, uh, diacotron instabilities, Poincare functions and so forth, like, like uh, uh, billiard balls on a table. Okay, statistical variations. Uh, the, these help self-organize self and they will end up in the structures that, that they can stabilize into by nature. So uh, what I'm trying to do is connect to what you observed, uh, Irina, and, and uh, uh, what I have observed in physical manifestations of this phenomena. So that, that's one thing. I wanna thank you, Zetalepin, for sharing your, uh, um, uh, your experience of uh, loading uh, a dewar full of uh, prepared nickel powder. Um, and uh, th there are many aspects in this presentation. Is there, is there any fast questions someone wants to ask me? Uh, yes, I have one question. Vladimir Fepis, may I ask one question? Yes. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, Hutchinson effect. Uh, may you tell about um, this effect in more details? Uh, what is it, uh, Hutchinson effect, uh, as for your opinion? And um, of what I shall to do to uh, investigate this effect in my laboratory, for example? Is it possible well, or not? Well, it is non-trivial, but uh, I can tell you there are some very interesting things that we are doing which may help you uh, moving through the year. So uh, I, I have many samples from John Hutchison, both large and small, and I've analyzed some of them. When you look at the structures, it, it looks like there are magnetic structures that are formed on the surface. You can look at videos on our channel. And these are self-organized, if you can imagine two neodymium magnets and one's one the, 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 uh, the same poles, you can push them around on the table and they self-organize. But if they're similar poles, they'll jump together, okay? And you can't stop them doing it. And what you actually see with these structures is an organization of the matter, almost like it's based on magnetic pressure. So it, you're actually seeing a, um, in a synthesis of say aluminium and you have a spot and the uh, let's say four atoms of uh, aluminium have gone into the structure and out of it because they can't occupy the same space time because they're not bosonic out of it you've got four nucleons again but two of them are 24 uh, uh, magnesium and and two of them are uh, 28 silicon or something 26 magnesium whatever you get magnesium the interesting thing is the heavier element that's synthesized in that process is a spot in the center and the magnesium is around the outside 
so that the, at the densest point you get the heaviest elements and this is exactly what we observed in the line reactor and in other experiments in this magnetic flux loop you end up getting a, a material compacted in a way which and i describe this as putting things into a small box at the very basic level it's putting it into a um a uh, a, a um a, a, almost like a wormhole but it's not it does have dimension uh, certainly it has dimension when the field breaks down because the material comes back with its uh, uh, normal scales as it were now in terms of some of the structural effects i described one where in the, the aluminium but in say a steel uh, bar um there were some examples where a a a, a wrench had been split and at the split points there were south-south and north-north poles next to each other. And people su suspected that this was a monopole, but I suggest that it is one of the EVOs is growing. It's being fed electrons or it's being fed other, other type of bosons, which it's accumulating. And it's building the magnetic field up. It's building the magnetic field up. But because the steel is magnetic, the, the, the metal it is magnetic, I, it can make anything magnetic with, with enough, enough strength. It locks itself into place. So you have two magnets with a North Pole next to each other. And what happens is they get so strong, so big, but it's highly localized that it splits the metal in half. And so they move apart. And so you end up with a North and North and a South and a South. And, and so, it, but in aluminium, aluminium is beautiful because the, the electrons are, are much more free to move. Uh, but also because it's not magnetic, aluminium tends to jiggle around. Things don't get locked into place. So the, the, the exotic vacuum objects that are on the surface can ride around on the surface or go into the grain boundaries and split it up as, we, as we've observed. So there's a difference between the way something non-magnetic will behave with these things and something that is uh, magnetic because it's not raising the temperature. Even if it's looking orange hot at, at 800 degrees, it's not raising the temperature, but it is removing its structural integrity. I see. Uh, thank you. I would like um, uh, to give one more reference. Uh, it may be interesting uh, to you both. Володь, 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 у него, у него, Володь, у него совсем времени нет, поэтому... I have my screen, my screen, just okay. to read. Володь, у него нет времени, пойми, пожалуйста. Okay. Не надо комментарий, вопрос, и потом мы в переписке mm. можно, так? Валер, можно мне вопрос? Да, конечно, Климов вопрос. Good day, uh, Bob. Very interesting presentation. And my, my question concerning to the uh, plasmoid uh, uh, physics uh, in your presentations. We have uh, uh, some uh, experimental results, uh, results concerning to the microwave plasmoids, uh, which can be uh, uh, combined uh, two groups. Uh, uh, one of them has very strong magnetic properties, like your uh, uh, model, and another uh, electrical uh, 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 plasmoids with uh, strong electrical uh, <coughs> properties. And uh, uh, my question concerning to the magnetic plasmoids, uh, uh, which is very close to, the, to your model. Uh, uh, in uh, this case, we have a magnetic flux, uh, uh, and to this uh, flux, uh, according to the quantum mechanics, uh, must be uh, 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 must be uh, have a uh, um, uh, quantum value of the mag magnetic field and a very strong interaction with the uh, external magnetic field. What do you think about uh, the possible uh, interaction of the uh, external magnetic field in your experimental results? Well, in 2017, I used a, a neodymium magnet, a small one placed uh, 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 horizontally uh, with the same uh, Suhas Ralkar um, uh, ultrasonically 
synthesized fuel that I showed in this presentation. And uh, what between the fuel and the magnet, I had some uh, um, uh, polyethylene, uh, uh, a PET bottle, uh, um, like a cut, cut bottom of a PET bottle. And it was about, I guess, uh, two centimeters from the container that was also in a plastic container. But in the direction of the magnet, the, the, there were tracks, which I showed during my Sochi presentation, which showed uh, these uh, many, many different types of uh, classic uh, exotic vacuum object tracks. But it was only in the direction of the magnet. Now, also, um, I forget his name right now, but uh, um, the guy, uh, Keith Fredericks, Keith Fredericks uh, used his fingers on X-ray film uh, and he put a magnet again in the same orientation on his magnetic film. And from his fingers, he was able to create a good proportion of the observed basic strange radiation tracks. Now, that isn't to say this is something that's magic coming from his fingers, because in 2010, Ken Shoulders said the most basic way you can make strange radiation is to get some static on your body and discharge it through the points in your fingers. So uh, he, he's only doing what is the most basic way uh, recommended by Ken Shoulders for, for making strange radiation tracks. But he was using a magnet to uh, influence them. And it would appear, as far as my understanding, that there was some influence from the magnet. This part is why that I think this is a magnetic structure. But I've moved on from there to see these incredibly magnetic effects and, and, and clustering nature of it both in, in physical and in x-ray uh, structures that would imply they are uh, magnetic in structure. And to, to speak to your point about microwave, the, uh, the, can, uh, John Hutchison generally did use microwaves in his uh, field interference combined with the static and uh, even magnetics. So he would have often a very, very large neodymium magnet to what he called shape fields. And he also had aluminium to reflect fields. And in some experiments, he had a large sample of uranite. And as you know from Alexander Shishkin's presentation, he has found that both, uh, um, he's found that cesium-137 produces uh, string, uh, string vortex solitons, which I call black Evo tracks. Uh, and, and so these things would fit together. That, and, and, and essentially what you need to do is, is to nucleate, as Shoulders said, the exotic vacuum object in your subject, and then you spin it up, you charge it up. And the, in, in the case of shoulders, he was, he was polarizing them with a, not shoulders, with Hutchison, he's polarizing it with the electric field. And then he's using the interfering magnetic fields, uh, electromagnetic fields to potentially use light to spin them up. Now, in the case of the supernova reactor that I talked about in the presentation, that's using a standard microwave 2.45 gigahertz magnetron. And I'm going to be exploring whether I can use that uh, in the dusty plasma environment to stimulate the beta decay of um, uh, principally carbon-14 and uh, uh, potassium-40. And if that's the case, then there's a good opportunity to deal with other radioactive wastes. OK, OK. Thanks very much. Very, very uh, large information. And uh, uh, concerning my uh, question, uh, I think is not simple question, and I have no answer for, for, for my question. Uh, and I hope uh, I sent you a message with uh, uh, our own experimental result with the plasmoid and its interaction with the external magnetic field. Oh, is, was that the presentation you gave two weeks ago? Okay. Okay. Bob, th thanks very much for your presentation. 